Atheist Nomads, episode 134, news for February 18, 2016. The podcast you're about to listen to includes cursing and talking about hoo-hahs. Please be advised. We are the Atheist Nomads, bringing you history, science, politics, religion, and interviews with leaders in the atheist community. Not all those who wander are lost. Welcome to another episode of Atheist Nomads. I am Dustin. Joining me as always is Wesley. Hello, everybody. Hey, if there's a musician around, you know, write in because it's time to change that music. Ah, well, we actually have a musician who is going to be advertising with us here shortly. Holy shit. So we'll have to, he hasn't gotten me any of the music yet, but okay. who knows? Maybe. All right. Fucking A. Let's do this. Yeah. And uh, Lauren isn't with <laughs> us today. She has a headache. Oh, shit. Yeah. Yeah. She kind of overdid it today, helping out a friend and uh, going to the dog park and yeah. Aww. Yeah. It sucks. How about you? What you been up to? Oh, man. I have been busy. I know I've been busy. (laughs) (laughs) Fair enough. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Life happens. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, One thing that's been coming up is uh, Lauren is working on some projects. So I'm helping out with the tech side on that. And uh, Mm -hmm. we won't announce those until something's actually up on it. But okay. Yeah. Hmm. Well, uh, MJ, my sweet, sweet girlfriend, took me to see Deadpool for Valentine's Day. <laughs> and it was all that we could hope for and more. But, uh, yeah, then we uh, helped my, my buddy uh, Bob move into his new place. He just got a liver transplant. Hi, Bob. Because you yeah. listen. Because, yeah, because you're awesome like that. Anyways, yeah. Wicked, yeah, congrats on the liver. Wicked awesome T scar across his stomach. It's pretty cool mm. yeah i also sta- his staples out oh. i also saw deadpool yeah what'd you think and i like the story okay unfortunately mm. every time past the first you know 10 minutes when i was starting to get into the story mm-hmm. uh every time they broke the fourth wall yeah it ruined it for me really over you know- and over and over again I mean, that's like his thing, right? It, it, did you know that going into it? I didn't. Okay. And that's not my thing. Okay. I yeah. like stories. I yeah. like, but for me to enjoy it, I need to be able to get into the story and stay sure. in the story. So breaking the fourth like, wall ruins that. Did you like Ferris Bueller's day off? No. Okay, fair enough. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, well, shitty. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah, but uh, Deadpool is all about breaking, like, walls everywhere. Uh, He's got, like, different different sides of his conscious talking. Uh, You're breaking fourth walls everywhere. Uh, Yeah, it's, it's almost like a... Was it uh, Zack Snyder from uh, Saved by the Bell kind of level of, you know, fourth wall breaking? I was way too young when that show was out. Yeah. Well, okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, so... You, it, you got the reference a little bit. I, I, I wanted I'm to... I, I, I liked the storyline enough mm-hmm. that what made it really sucky for me is I wanted to enjoy the movie. Okay. But because oh, of the man. breaking of the fourth wall, I couldn't. And it, it would have been fine if it was there wasn't a compelling story that was drawing me in. Because then I just wouldn't have given a shit. <laughs> okay. And so instead, I gave oh. a shit. Hmm. Well, shitty. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, the, the thing with uh, stuff like that is not everybody's going to like it and that's okay sure sure 
man, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, I actually used to read a lot of comics when I was younger. Um, nowhere near as, as many as like my, a lot of my friends, but man, I think both of us are just really having a hard time focusing today. This is shitty, but yeah, uh, I didn't, yeah. I didn't read comics. Uh, I didn't have those available. So I missed out on that. Well, yeah. Uh, yeah. Deadpool that that's totes his thing though. Yeah. Anyways, that and chimichangas. <laughs> I do love chimichangas. <laughs> there you go. Uh, all right. Anyway, let's go ahead and move into dusting off the degree. Ooh, okay. So last time we talked about how one God became three while somehow still being one. But we actually need to move further back into the God and gods of the ancient Jews. First off, uh, you have to discard the quote history found in the first half of the Old Testament because if for no other reason... We don't have manuscripts that come anywhere near the time that they were allegedly written. And there is solid linguistic evidence that, for example, the Pentateuch, that is the five books of of Moses, had at least four authors from vastly different time periods. These and the rest of the pre-exilic texts have no evidence to actually date them and those which predate Josiah and his reforms were likely heavily edited at some point during his reign while he was trying to reform the Jews to following Yahweh. The most uh, historically plausible take on it is that the Israelites were just one Canaanite tribe, not a band of nomads who wandered from Mesopotamia to Canaan to Egypt and then back. There are plenty of descriptions of Israelites, villages, and even kings worshiping different gods, and no one discounting that they really were gods, just that there was the one who was supposed to be the dominant god of the Israelites, and that was Yahweh. And you can also, as you read through, see that he was one of the gods that was popular, and then kind of started to become more and more the God that was popular, or they just wrote that into it after the Yahweh followers won. (laughs) Those who followed Yahweh also attributed everything to him. He commanded good deeds, and he tempted people into sin. Most notably in 2 Samuel 24, when again the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he incited David against them. God then punished the people for David's sin that God had tempted David into committing. Oh, and what was the sin? Performing a census. Something that any reasonable king would want to do. You need to know how many people you have so you can know if you can fight wars and how much money you can get in taxes. In 1 Chronicles 21, the same story is again told. And it starts with, Then Satan stood against Israel and incited David to number Israel. So what changed? Pre-exile to Babylon, Yahweh was the God of Israel and commanded both good and evil. When good things happened to the Israelites, it meant that God was happy with them. When bad things happened, it was because God was mad at them. Of course, that's what you get when you worship a pagan god of war. Ooh. When in Babylon, the Israelites encountered Zoroastrianism with two gods, one good and one evil. By the time the Israelites returned to Canaan, Yahweh inherently became good and incapable of evil. He was the cause of everything good that happened to them, and all the other gods that their ancestors and neighbors had worshipped were false, not even real beings. And anything that wasn't good was caused by the adversary, which in Hebrew is the word Satan. (laughs) First and second Chronicles were books written after the exile to retell the history of the Israelites from their first king to their last. Rewriting things that didn't fit in with their new theology, such as who tempted David to sin. Satan only shows up in two other places in the Old Testament. A major character in the book of Job, which is probably the post-exilic telling of a much older legend, and the post-exilic 
prophetic book of Zechariah. The word Satan shows up other times, but it either lacks the article to make it clear that it was a name or title, or it's clear in the context that it's talking about a person who is the adversary. And next time, we will take a look at the role of Satan in Christianity. So in those, <clears throat> so in those couple other times, when it's uh, talking about a, a person, you're just saying that it's not talking about a god, though? Or a, an a fallen angel? Not a fallen angel, not a, a god. It's somebody who is in an adversarial role with a prophet or king. Okay. Because hmm. Satan yeah, just sure. means adversary. All right. And not it's av- adversary yeah. to me doesn't even mean bad person. I mean, it's just a, a challenger, somebody who's challenging you. Doesn't have right. to be a bad thing. The reason why Satan became the evil one is because this was the adversary of the all good God. So he, and the adversary of the all good bad. God must be all bad. Obviously. Okay. Even yeah. though even though the all good God created him supposedly Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay 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 right yeah (laughs) uh there there is a time balance and god there's a passage here oh go ahead sounds like the movie time balance where god creates the pure and concentrated evil (laughs) anyways yeah 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 and there was a a part of it where in ezekiel um it's believed by a lot of Christians to describe the fall of Satan. But there wasn't even a concept of Satan when that book was written. <laughs> yeah, I, I still think there was a lot of uh, shoehorning and people were just trying to make it sound like Yahweh was way more popular than he was. Because wasn't mm-hmm. he just like some localized tribal god? Yep. I mean, uh, well, um, uh, well, um, what was the shortened name for him? It was like just wasn't Yahweh. It was just Hashem. I know another one. It's just like one syllable. God. L. L. Oh, L. Yeah. Uh. Anyways, yeah. I mean, that was just like a couple. You know, just the god of a couple hills of well like a, l couple, was a couple small families l was actually just the hebrew word for god right elohim gods and there are some some passages where it talks about elohim mm-hmm. doing things the gods but that is generally interpreted as being the royal we yeah, that's bullshit, but okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's bullshit. I mean, Genesis talks, I mean, he's talking to other people in Genesis. Either other gods or, or angels or the void. Mm. Oh, yeah. goodness. <laughs> All right. Um, but yeah, Satan gets much more interesting in Christianity. So he gets much a more lot interesting. more credit than he deserves. Mm hmm. All right. He we're going to take I our. Don't think he was, I don't think he was fucking shit up. <laughs> Anyways, yeah. <laughs> All right. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be back with history. Atheist Nomads is proudly brought to you by Archway Hosting. Check out their low price, full featured hosting solutions at archwayhosting.com. That's A R C H W A Y hosting.com. Hey, we're also brought to you by listeners just like you. Find out how you can become a patron at patreon.com forward slash atheist nomads. That's P A T R E O N.com forward slash atheist nomads. All right, so this day in history, February 18th, the year 1930, the ninth and no longer ninth planet, Pluto, was discovered. Um, Yay! Yeah, yay, and uh, (laughs) Neil, you bastard. 
Anyways. Uh, the, the first uh, dwarf planet was discovered. <laughs> now dwarf. Yeah. Uh, so this uh, Kuiper Belt object. Yes. Uh, Pluto. Goodness. Uh, Pluto was uh, actually discovered by a guy named Clyde Tomba in, of course, 1930. Uh, but there's some, some interesting history around this. Um, in 1906, there's a guy named Percival Lowell, who's a wealthy guy from Boston who founded, of course, the Lowell observatory in Flagstaff, Arizona, which is still going strong. Uh, and him and a few other people were looking for this planet X, which, uh, Lowell, uh, William Pickering and others were, uh, you know, hot on the trail back in 1909, and they suggested several possible locations for the planet. And you know what? Uh, they kept on searching until Lowell's death in 1916, but to no avail, of course. So, um, yeah, at, after his death, it was like 10 years later before a bunch of controversy in uh, Lowell's uh, uh, affairs between him and the observatory. So it, it, there's just shit going on anyways uh once that once they got all the dust settled uh, uh clyde tomba he was helping out and well I should say he was like the main observer and fucking made this discovery on you know february 18th but uh so yeah it, it's it's actually kind of funny that uh while they were doing their early work lowell uh, he actually took a couple different pictures of Pluto, but they didn't recognize it. <laughs> so, <who? laughs> yeah, uh, his surveys captured two faint images of Pluto on March 19th and April 7th of 1915. So, uh, yeah, it took quite a few years later for them to actually get, you know, known that that's was that they were actually taking pictures of Pluto already. Anyways, uh, hmm. There was also one other picture from uh, 1909 that uh, was made by the Yerkes Observatory, and that one, you know, definitely predates all the rest. But they just were taking pictures and just accidentally got one of Pluto in there. But anyways, uh, yeah, <sighs> yeah. Well, and they they predicted this looking at the wobbles in, in the orbits of, of Uranus and Neptune, mm -hmm. which is the same basic methodology that suggests that there's a new planet X. And yeah, I, I believe, you know, that's, it, that's a great way to detect uh, large objects out there. Yeah. And that uh, will, should tie into a story that we have later today. Yes. <laughs> so, a uh, little throw forward there. All right. So, next one. This day in history, the year 1954. The first Church of Scientology is established in Los Angeles. So, yeah, you might have heard of this uh, old kind of a kooky science fiction writer named uh, L. Ron Hubbard. Yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness. So, uh, yeah, if you've ever read a lovely book called Dianetics or uh, <laughs> stu studied uh, any of his early works, you'll know that uh, he's known for writing really shitty science fiction and that he loves to uh, kind of take liberties with, with stuff, you might say. Uh, supposedly he was a, a naval, a, uh, a pilot in the, in the air force, I believe a captain in the Navy, a great musical composer and all this other stuff. But anyways, yeah, getting a little, a little ahead of myself here. <laughs> so yeah, man, L. Ron Hubbard, his wife, Mary Sue Hubbard and, uh, John Galusha were a couple of the, basically the. The originals, the founders, and uh, Hubbard was uh, fam famous for quoting. Well, famous quote of Hubbard's was a civilization without insanity, without criminals, and without war 
where the able can prosper and, and honest beings can have rights, and where man is free to rise to greater heights. Those are the aims of Scientology. So, man, what a windbag. Hmm. <laughs> Those are, you know, noble a, uh, aims, but sure, they don't really go about it the right way. Well, you know, he's talking about um, thetans and, uh, you know, the, the basically, oh, I'm not going to break into all of Scientology, but it's it's a weird and wacky religion that is 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 just a giant space opera and it's trapped alien souls that cause you problem problems sure but you know that's they, that's they were, weird that all those trapped alien souls essentially came here from another galaxy on giant uh dc7s as i recall because mm -hmm. well that's essentially what they looked like and yeah volcanoes you know all the souls went into the volcanoes and then just like uh, volcanoes erupted and all those horrible soul thetans came out and like infected us. And I mean, it's crazy. You got to read the shit. It's awesome. I mean, I should read some more of it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Seriously. Oh, you know, uh, no. Ross and Carrie right now is, uh, doing Scientology for their, oh, their podcast. They've done the first episode. There's going to be two or three more. I didn't even know they were still a thing. Yeah, they actually, in their their investigation, mm -hmm. um, went far enough to be certified to do auditing. Oh, goodness. Yeah. Man, okay. They're well, quite worried about potential lawsuits. <laughs> they should be worried about a lot more than that. They, they might, you know, get, <laughs> uh, have the uh, squirrel hunters on their ass. Yeah which is a group of people uh, that are hired by Scientology to follow around ex-members and, well, just fucking harass the shit out of them. Man, oh, man, yeah. oh, man. Oh, goodness. So, moving on along. This day in history, the year 1955, Operation Teapot. Uh this is actually uh, Teapot's first test shot, which is called WASP, and that it was successfully detonated at a Nevada test site with a yield of 1.2 kilotons. Uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, we really needed to develop a proper nuclear weapon, and, and this was one of them. That's kind of weird and scary. But uh, like I said... Uh, Teapot was a series of 14 different nuke tests that, uh, you know, can had proper fucking explosions, uh, in the Nevada test site. And, uh, you know, there's really not much to this one, but holy shit. Yeah. Um, we used to nuke ourselves in little tiny islands just to make <laughs> sure it worked. Mm hmm. Yeah. So just throwing this one out there as a little mini because it's just really sad and weird. Yeah. Needing to make sure that, well, because what happened was we had developed three nuclear weapons during, uh, as part of uh, the Manhattan project. Yeah. One was Manhattan detonated Blue. in Nevada. The other two in Japan. <laughs> it took six years to build any more. And Russia had them before the U.S. was nuclearly armed again. Hmm. So they were really wanting to step up their game by 1955. They were also at that point uh, getting the B-52 underway so that they could be able to develop, deliver it anywhere. And take us on the brink of total annihilation. Yeah, well, you can thank like a Werner Heisenberg and on the German side for you know, really pushing the Americans to develop a nuke because you know we mm -hmm. didn't want to be the well, we didn't want to have the Germans be the only ones with a fucking nuke at the table. Yeah, Thank <laughs> thankfully they never got there, but yeah. 
Fuck. Oh, side note, there is an amazing little uh, one-season TV show. I think it's from some uh, one of the small northern uh, European countries. The show is called uh, Heavy Water War, and hmm. it it's really cool. It, it goes between, uh, let's see, Norway's perspective, Germany's perspective, and uh, England's perspective during World War II as they're trying to uh, develop a, a, a nuke in Germany, get the supplies that they need from Norway, which is a uh, heavy water and England as they try and stop the delivery of the heavy water from Norway to Germany. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah it's only like six or eight episodes, but as long as you like subtitles, you're going to fucking love it. So hmm. check it out. Nice. All right, moving on along. This day in history, the year 2011, Gary Ridgway, the Green River serial serial killer, pleads guilty to his 49th murder. I'm just wow. going to let that hang there for a second. 49. Yeah, so um, Gary Ridgway, um, he, he um, basically killed a whole lot of... Per- People in the Pacific Northwest around uh, Seattle, Kent, Auburn, and yeah, left them in a ravine near Auburn. And man, this is some really weird shit. In the 1980s, uh, Washington State was just seriously terrorized by this guy. Uh, they didn't know if it was just one guy or like a couple and like some copycats going on or what, but holy shit. Yeah. Um, he ended up uh, pleading, uh, having a plea deal in 2003, where Gary Ridgway admitted to f- murdering 48 women between 1982 and 1998. And uh, that deal was so that the prosecutors would not seek the death penalty against him. And uh, as long as he cooperated with the police in locating you know, the remains of dozens of victims. And, uh, wow. yeah, so, um, fuck. <laughs> you know, yeah, you know, when you, when you hit that many, why don't you just like, uh, he's probably just like forgotten some of the people, some of the women that he killed. So he's like, oh mm-hmm. yeah, that one was mine too. If I get toss it on the pile, uh, just crazy. I mean, he'd already, <laughs> already uh, got convicted and was serving a sentence of 48 uh, consecutive life sentences. Wow. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, He is definitely by far the uh, most prolific serial killer that we've had in the U S so far as we know. And, and definitely in Washington. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. This homeboy had, had my family terrorized when, I was like really fucking young. Uh, he used to pick up women off the street, strangle them in his home or his truck, and actually uh, meticulously hid their bodies near natural landmarks such as uh, trees or logs uh, in an attempt to keep track of them. So I'm assuming he could probably go back and visit them later. Hmm. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. This this dude was sick. Anyway, so yeah, mostly he killed prostitutes because he knew he could get away with it. Yeah, well, that's pretty fucked up, right there. I wasn't even going to go to that. Yeah, but, one yeah. of the reasons why it's important to at least decriminalize, if not legalize, prostitution. Definitely, uh, women need to have legal recourse when you prohibit something legal recourse isn't an option violence is the only option you have to deal with things and when you legalize it you bring it out of the shadows it's going to be a lot safer for everyone and people can call the cops they can press charges yeah yeah, you know, yeah. I mean, that just tangents onto like a whole bunch of uh, other things, like 
you know, better health care, uh, mm-hmm. of course, safety. But yeah, um, yeah, just because you're a sex worker doesn't mean that you're not a person. Fuck. All right. Anyways. Well, on that note, we're going to take another quick break and then we'll be back with science. We love hearing from our listeners. Yeah. You can email us at contact at atheistnomads.com, tweet us at atheistnomads, send us a message on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash atheistnomads, or better yet, call us and leave us a message at 541 203 0666. We might even play it on the show. You can also help us out by leaving us a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or your podcast directory of choice. All right, this is something that Lauren prepared, but I will be uh, taking care of it, working from her notes. Uh, A hundred years ago, Einstein's theory of relativity predicted that when two black holes merged, the cataclysmic event would send waves of epic proportions through space-time called a gravitational wave. Sounds neat, but how on earth would you sense them? That's where LIGO comes in. On September 14, 2015, the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatories did just that. Based in Hanford, Washington and Livingston, Louisiana, these two huge underground instruments confirmed that a gravitational wave had passed through Earth and literally gave cosmologists a new sense in their quest for learning about space. They did learn that the two black holes measured were 29 to 36 times the size of our sun, and the event occurred about 1.3 billion years ago. Since black holes are impossible to see with a typical light-based telescope, by listening for gravitational waves, scientists can now learn a monumental amount about our universe. There's way too much for us to really explain here, but this announcement is a game changer in astronomical physics, and everyone should be excited about this happening in our lifetime. Game changer shit. This is going to open up like new types of uh, actually discovering things out in space. I mean, this is going to, there's going to be new degrees coming out in a few years. Mm-hmm. Well, and this oh. was one of the final areas in the theory of relativity that hadn't been demonstrated yet. I think this is the last one. At least the last major one. Uh, and predicted a yeah. hundred years ago and finally found. It's so fucking cool because and and so fucking hard to to find because these things are well, these gravity waves actually just go right through you. So mm-hmm. I mean, detecting something that, you know, you know, just fucking goes through everything is difficult as fuck. Obviously. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and this really goes to show one of the most amazing things with science. There are predictions that get shown out in the math that are hard to find. Things like a distant object that we can't see, like Pluto or Planet X or gravitational waves. The math shows it's there, but we can't observe it. Um, the same thing happened with the Higgs boson. It was predicted that it should be there. But technology hadn't caught up with being able to actually find it. And it is so cool when the technology finally catches up with the science to be able to prove those predictions. It's especially cool when it takes 100 years for engineering to catch up. You mentioned the uh, you you mentioned the Higgs there for a second, and, and they oh, discovered that at CERN, didn't they? Mm-hmm. Uh, just a pretty cool side note from something that came out like well, I don't know, six months ago. China is building a another CERN like a, a large uh, LHC that is going to be about three times the size of CERN. So, holy crap! <laughs> yeah, it's going to be fucking massive. Wow. Uh, it says a 27 kilometer long tunnel. Oh, no, no, no. Shit, shit, shit. So it's way bigger. I'll leave it at that. Okay, let's move on. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Damn. 
Yeah. All right. We'll take our last break and then we'll be back with politics and religion. If you like this show, consider giving us some financial support. To make it really easy with one-time donations or to support us on a per episode, monthly, or even annual basis using PayPal or Patreon, find out more at atheistnomads.com. Use the links on the right side of the page. One dollar an episode is all we ask. Please, think of the kittens. And so we thought of the kittens. Continuing. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> all right, we are continuing our state legislative update. Uh, mm-hmm. It is not all bad this time, <laughs> which is nice. Uh, but there's there's plenty of bad. I could have filled it all with bad, but you know. Anyway, um, Idaho State Representative Gannon is, has again introduced legislation to repeal Idaho's faith healing exemption and child welfare laws. Good. This is something that even Governor Bitch Otter, uh, ex- excuse me, um, Butch <laughs> Otter. <laughs> a Freudian slip, I'm sure. A Freudian script, a scripted slip. <laughs> oh. <laughs> there is a uh, a local beer called Bitch Otter. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I'm sure it, it, it's. I'm sure it's loved way more than Billy Beer was. And when let's see, so 2014 in the the. Uh, state elections it was otter running for governor his lieutenant governor um brad little was also running for re-election and there was one other they were playing around with that um i forget which the other one was but you know little bitch otter and yeah, there we, we get some some fun names out here. Um, yeah. Anyway, so um, <clears throat> Butch Otter is pushing for at least giving uh, this a serious review. He had a a commission that was investigating the child deaths, and based on the report that came out, uh, they are strongly the commission is strongly encouraging uh, repealing the the shield laws. Uh, Butch Otter is less confident, but at least wants the the legislature to give it some serious thought and serious review. Hmm. The unfortunate thing is, even if this does pass, it will only remove one of the four statutes. <laughs> so it's unclear at this time if it would even prevent uh, prevent conviction. If it would prevent uh, convictions for medical neglect and manslaughter when parents fail to do their job and get their children treatment in the name of religion. As it stands, parents who never take their children to get medical care are protected. If you take the kid to the hospital and then take the kid away, then you are, they can prosecute you because the protection is only there if you rely on faith alone. Right. No takesies, backsies. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And there's, it's so deeply embedded, three, four different places. Um, uh, it, it, if they can at least get it pulled out in one spot, it'll create a mess in the courts and they'll have to remove the rest of the exemptions. It would at least be a step in the right direction. <laughs> uh, Idaho State Senator Cheryl Nuxall is pushing a bill that has already received preliminary approval from the Senate Education Committee that would explicitly allow the Bible to be used as a reference for, and I quote, literature, comparative religion, English and foreign languages, United States and world history, comparative government, law, philosophy, ethics, astronomy, biology, geology, world geography, Archaeology, music, sociology, and other topics of study. I think the only thing I don't really see in there that should be in a school is math. I think that's like the only thing that's that's <laughs> not Bible related. Oh, wow. Yeah. So okay, the the so your uh, school day will be Bible, 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 and math. 
Yep. And and P- MPE. This is okay. supposed to replace a section that was invalidated by the Supreme Court in the 60s that mandated daily Bible readings. So at least they're repealing that defunct part of the code. But holy crap. And what really sucks here is if this passes, it's going to cost taxpayers a lot of money. Well, you got to replace textbooks. Oh, if this passes... You can't single out just the Bible. If you're going to allow holy text to be used in classes, it need, all need to be included. This might be able to pass constitutional muster if it included the Quran and Bhagavad Gita and Tao Te Ching and Satanic verses, but it doesn't. Oh. I wanted to include the Kama Sutra. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, the Bible, it can already be used in literature, comparative religion, in some cases in English class and foreign language classes. It's going to come up in U.S. and world history, but it definitely has no place in science. It shouldn't be the focus of any of those subjects either. Now, th- this doesn't say that it has to be the focus, just it can be used as a reference. Mm. What this yeah, really I, means yeah, is... I don't, I don't want teachers just whipping out the Bible in social studies class. Well, I, th- I think you're, you're missing the real point or, of Or this. astronomy. Okay, go ahead. Biology and geology. Mm-hmm. Instead of having to use textbooks that deal with actual science, you can say, oh, in Genesis chapter one, it says that God created the heavens and the earth. Right. Yeah. No, I get this as a bid for creationism, but I'm just, I mean, that aside, I mean, it's just stupid to include this in, well, astronomy, law, Mm -hmm. world geography. World geography. Holy shit. Come on. <laughs> they they knew about one corner of a, one tiny little dusty country. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is uh, crazy. I, I hope it doesn't go anywhere. Uh, crazy bills in the Idaho State leg- Legislature have a tendency, like most state legislatures, to not go anywhere. In Idaho, this is exacerbated by the fact that the legislative session ends in April and they have to pass the year's budget before they can go home. (laughs) So they've only got two months left. And stupid stupid bills like this have a tendency to get dropped. (laughs) I'm still wondering, how are you going to shoehorn archaeology and music in there also? Like, Archaeology is easier uh, really, because you can try to claim be. that digs in the Middle East are proving the Bible. Really? I was, I was okay. They don't was, prove the Bible, but you can claim that. Let's go more for like uh, dinosaur bones and such, but that's paleontology. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> so you're totally out of it. Music. Um, are they going to sing the psalms? I don't know. <laughs> Anyways. Yeah. And sticking with Idaho for a third one, the Idaho State House Education Committee, led by Reed DeMorant from Eagle, has rejected Idaho's new science standards mm-hmm. over concerns over the public comment process that was used and it's dealing with the age of the Earth, creation of the universe, and global warming. Mm. It was a good, solid curriculum. Good science standards that dealt with science. And the education department 
when they finished this in August, um, they followed the standard public comment period. Okay. But according to DeMorant, uh, there wasn't enough public input taken in. Sure. Because, you know, public input is so important when dealing with science. I'd say most things in science aren't really open for debate um, unless you're like actually one of the people <laughs> that are doing the testing. It is what it is. Period. Mm. And so, okay, moving down to the South, uh, Mississippi, a bill in the Mississippi state house would allow public school teachers to discuss alternatives on the topics of biological evolution, chemical origins of life, global warming, and human cloning. <laughs> in other words, the bill is designed to allow teachers to promote creationism and discredit climate change. And what I love is that they always put human cloning in this list. Well, that's us trying to be God. Except it's not anything anyone is doing. At this you point, human know. cloning. Shadow governments. Shadow. Oh. At this point, human cloning is science fiction. It wouldn't belong in a science class right now. <laughs> and in Arizona, a right to know act that has been pushed for by American atheists and lobbied by the Secular Coalition for Arizona has been introduced in the state house by the ranking Democrat on the health committee, Dr. Randall Frizee, a trauma surgeon freeze. and medical school professor. Guarant guarantee freeze. Yeah, I don't care. Okay. Uh, this bill would require uh, healthcare providers to inform patients of medical options, particularly around reproductive health, that they refuse to perform for religious or philosophical reasons. Hmm. Simply just letting the patient know that those options are available. Man. So we need to introduce this doctor and uh, David Silverman to, well, the Satanists. The, <laughs> the Satanic Temple. Yeah, I'm sure uh, Silverman is familiar with them. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. And, um, Moving out of state legislatures, but staying in Arizona, Rabbi Adele Plotkin of Chino Valley, Arizona's Biet Torah Synagogue hmm. uh, complained to the mayor about how offensive the Christian prayers being offered in the town council meetings were. <laughs> she was assured that the prayers would be put on hold, but on February 9, despite being assured by the mayor that there would be no prayer and the rabbi making it clear that she would only attend if there was no prayer. The mayor, who is also a local pastor, decided to pray anyway. Hmm. When the mayor announced that there would be a prayer, the rabbi objected. When the mayor ended the prayer in Jesus' name, she objected again. <laughs> so he had her removed by the police. Yeah. The mayor believes that the constitutional prohibition on the establishment of religion means the state can't force secular humanism, which I think means separation of church and state in his mind. But FFRF has sent the town a letter. <laughs> oh, boy. I love the FFRF, and they're there to defend everybody. So, yep. Yeah. Yeah, good on you for making a stink, Rabbi. <laughs> yeah, but uh, oh man, what a what a dick move to have him. Well, have the rabbi removed from the from the council meeting. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> well, and her objections were because it offends her beliefs for people to be praying to Jesus in her presence. Sure. I mean, yeah. Jesus is not their Messiah, not their savior. So mm -hmm. yeah, it totally makes sense. 
stuff. Just like it would offend a lot of Christians for somebody to be praying to Allah. Oh, yeah. Even though that is the same God. Don't tell them that. It's a secret. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. This is awesome. Yeah. And moving right along. Is these next few are. Yeah, yeah. Um, by now, everyone should be aware that U.S. Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia died on Saturday. I, for one, do not mourn the death of the man who for so long has used the bench of the highest court in the land to spew forth his hatred of women, gays, and non-Christians, and to actively fight progress. Yeah, I'm pretty much cheering. <laughs> While this should be a moment to celebrate... Not that someone has died, want to make sure that's clear, but that Scalia is no longer on the Supreme Court. It isn't. Senate Majority <laughs> Leader Mitch McConnell announced the very next day that he would not allow the confirmation of anyone appointed by President Obama. A plethora of Republicans have stated they think it is inappropriate for the president to appoint someone during his last year of office despite the fact that it is his duty in the Constitution to do so. He would yeah. be violating the Constitution to, by not doing that. And don't forget that uh, fucking Reagan did it. Uh, look at uh, yeah. Kennedy. He, he was confirmed mm -hmm. in his last year. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's not very often that uh, sitting members from the Supreme Court actually die. <laughs> on the Supreme Court. It was a uh, William Rehnquist under uh, G W G.W. Bush that uh, died last previously. Mm -hmm. But uh, before that, you were saying it was like 50 or 60 years before that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, sure. It's sad. Okay. But yeah, um, this gets, this gets really ugly really quick. I mean, we have eight people on the Supreme Supreme court now. So, yep. Uh, if you got the right uh, saying that they they won't let the president uh, nominate, a, uh, well, uh, they won't support anybody that the president nominates and that he might as well fuck off and not put mm -hmm. a person in, uh, that gets really ugly, especially if uh, elections roll around like they're uh, bound to at some time. Mm -hmm. And what if we have another tie like we had in 2000? Uh, yeah. Uh, now you got a Supreme court that, you know, might not be able to function properly. And, you know, the state's saying, Hey, you know, we have a tie here. What the fuck do we do? And, you know, that could be really shitty really quick. Yeah. A four, four court four conservatives, there's, four liberals. There's a reason you got a tiebreaker. <laughs> uh huh. Because if they come to a four, four vote, there's no decision. And there's a lot of things, important things like, a uh, uh, women's rights. Uh, there's, shit, there's a, quite, a few like really important cases rolling down this year too. As Obama's well. immigration plans. Mm -hmm. There's, uh, there's a lot. Yeah. And I would say we are 80% plus uh, guaranteed to get a uh, Democrat in office, be that Hillary or Bernie. Mm -hmm. And what the fuck do you think the uh, Republicans think are going to fucking happen? I mean, they're going to get a, another liberal uh, uh, justice in there pretty soon. Well, what I, it's the way I now see it, or a year from now, the way I see it, they have, if they can hold this off, and a Democrat gets that appointment, uh, they haven't lost anything. Mm -hmm. But if they can hold it off and they can energize their base and they <laughs> can get a Republican in and they can maintain hold of the Senate, then they not only get to fill that seat and maintain a 5-4 majority in the Supreme three. Court, there's three more who will likely retire or die during the next president's term. Yeah, Two liberal, one conservative. Even just with uh, one, one more conservative justice on there, uh, if they get that, you know, if they get the pre you know president 
conservative president. Then they get the conservative justice. Then they already have a conservative uh, Congress. Holy shit. If this all works out the way I'm, I think they're hoping in five years time, they'll have a seven to two in five years, conservative leaning court in five years time. Will the, the planet earth still be habitable? <laughs> I mean, I'm not even joking. Will there be war? Uh, fuck, you know, fuck global warming. I mean, man. But, you know, <laughs> if, if, if a, a Democrat wins, yeah, then a Democrat still gets to fill that seat and gets the next three. And we have a six to three liberal leaning court. I believe the shortest amount of time that it's ever taken to get a, a justice from like nominated to, to actually on the, on the bench is like 30, 35 days. And the longest is like 120 days. Yeah. So the I mean, average from, yeah. well, average from nomination to confirmation is 25 days. So pretty fucking quick, about a month under a month. Yeah. So Obama can nominate, I think it was like 12 or 13 between now and his last day in office. Assuming they handle it quickly. They're not going to. No, no. I'm just saying uh, using the average right there. I mean, even if they use the outside longest, you, he could still get like two and a half nominations in just using the, the longest. Well, the, the problem is current. this is our first Supreme Court opening with a non-functioning Congress since the Civil War. <laughs> so all of the rules that have applied from 2010 all the way back to 1865 don't apply. Yeah, that was the last time that we had a a 8-8 a, a court for a really long time, like a year mm -hmm. plus, was because of the fucking Civil War. Yeah. The Senate didn't have enough people to actually operate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. God damn it. Fuck you Republicans. Get, do your job. Yeah. That'd be nice. Because yeah, what it comes down to is the president has a constitutional right and duty to nominate someone for the Supreme Court. And they have a constitutional right and duty to advise and consent. Now, consent means they can say no, but they at least need to answer. And if they wait for, say, the next president and the next Congress, when they might not have a majority in the Senate, Bernie or Hillary could push through very liberal judges with no problem. Whereas if they advise and consent now with Obama, they could get Obama to put through a moderate judge. <laughs> and they're doubling down, betting on winning. On Trump getting elected. Trump or Cruz or Rubio or someone. I think Rubio is pretty much out of it already. I mean, he's doing all right, but yeah. I think that's going to taper off pretty quick. It's going to be Trump or Cruz, and unless Trump goes third party, it's, which he's talking about it again already, um, it's way too soon to be saying how it's it's going to go. We're we're down to six people still running for the Republican nomination. <laughs> It'll be a month before it, it starts settling out. I I just really hope that uh, Trump goes third party. <laughs> that that will completely destroy them. Yeah. All right. We have more good news. Oh, yeah. <laughs> After 41 days, the occupation at the national, the, the, uh, Malheur national wildlife refuge is over. Yay. The last four militants surrendered last week. And as of the date of recording, a total of 25 have been indicted on federal conspiracy charges. And all but one of those 25 
have been arrested. Also, Daddy Bundy has been arrested. Oh, he proper got the book through at him. Also on federal conspiracy charges. The That's day so before the stories. surrender, he was flying out there to go show his support, and the FBI was waiting at the airport with him unarmed. Oh, it's man. just beautiful. <laughs> yeah, Cliven got he got the book throw, thrown at him. Uh, let's see. He owes the government millions. He should have the book thrown at him. Fuck yeah. <laughs> let's see. Uh, 74-year-old Bundy was charged with conspiracy to interfere with federal officer. The, uh, the same charges that his sons are facing. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Also a weapons charge. Uh, I believe there was a, a, there was a, a two or three other charges on him also, I think. Oh, I suspect there will be more charges on all of them. Yeah. They just needed to have the indictments to arrest them. Well, so, they decided they wanted to have the indictments before they arrested them. So going back to sad little Fry, he was the last holdout. <laughs> Man, did you actually listen to the um, the live recording, the live streaming? No, I didn't. This dude was going on about alien conspiracies being covered up by the government. Uh, <laughs> there was uh, stuff about uh, the chemicals that they're putting into our water. There's he, and then basically right at the end. He said he would walk out if everybody outside said hallelujah. And yeah. He, not even joking. So, like, all the FBI agents out, outside fucking said hallelujah. And, he, you know, he put his guns down and, and fucking walked out and got arrested. Yep. But homeboys got just fucking mental issues. Conspiracy theory. Oh, yeah. Theory whack job. Yeah. they're They're all that way. Oh, this this one more than mo than most. I mean, he needs help. I yeah, mean, some of them just need jail, but this one, ooh, <laughs> man. Yeah, I think it was would have been weekend before last. We did go to the survival con oh. here in Boise. Oh goodness, that sounds horrible. Uh, Lauren was expecting some cool ideas on camping equipment. I was expecting a bunch of nut jobs. Yeah. It was about half alternative medicine. <laughs> nice. Well, yeah. Uh, let them waste herbal, their money on that shit. Herbal remedies, books on how to treat yourself with stuff. Some of that makes sense. You know, the herbal stuff oh, makes yeah. sense if you're survivalist. Sure. But it went way past that. And a lot of uh, weapons-related stuff, uh, very little camping stuff. Mm. Um, it was quite disappointing. <laughs> and the crazy was actually slightly lower than I expected, I would say. Yeah. Was there a lot of uh, like freeze-dried and powdered goods there? No. No, this would no. be mostly targeting the uh, Mormon survivalists who would all already have several years worth of food stored up in their pantries. Sure. Okay. Oof. So different kind of, of survivalist than say survivor man style. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Oh man. Or Adventist survival, which is run to the woods and eat berries and trap rodents. Really? Oh, well you like did the whole, I don't know, survivalist training thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I've been through the Adventist survival training course. That's when nine yeah. 11 hit, right? Yep. Man. Yep. So is that some like a summer camp thing that you went to occasionally? Uh, like, no, it, once it's a year uh, or something. It's senior survival. So senior year of high school mm -hmm. at Adventist boarding schools, at least in the Northwest, uh, they take you out into the woods and teach you how to survive for a week. Instead of having your normal classes, you have survival classes. All right. We had senior skip and you got fucking tossed in the woods. Yep. Yep. <laughs> okay. 
Man. And for our final story, David Janey, the now former head pastor of the Orlando Baptist Church, a mega church, mm. has resigned from his job in disgrace. Oh, no. And it all started with an affair with Arlene Miranda, then a promise of hush money <laughs> that was forced on her by the church, not by him, then failure to pay up, then a lawsuit, which made all of this come to light, <laughs> and then the church being very unhappy with him for what he had done and got caught for. Oh, why is it? Always sexual. Man. The, okay. I had some, some warnings about this in my, my ministerial training. Really? Yeah. That the, you know, when you have pastors counseling people and up front, um, in a position of power and influence and getting a lot of attention, you end up getting a little bit of the, the rock star effect. Mm, mm -hmm. Add to it the intimacy that you get when you counsel people, and it's not uncommon for. Add the infallibility of religion. Yeah, and then it's not uncommon for women to to throw themselves at their pastor. Mm. It's also not uncommon for, and they didn't warn us about <laughs> this part in school. It's not uncommon for pastors to take advantage of that power imbalance and rock star status. <laughs> yeah. Mm. So that's, that's why it's always funny. sex. Mm, mm, mm. Well, it's still funny. <laughs> oh yeah, it, it is. At least like no child got molested this time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is always good. Yeah. Child's getting molested is bad. In, in, in general, yeah, pretty bad. Yeah. <laughs> yep. All right, oh. and we have feedback. Oh, boy, do we. Uh, first off, from Rusty at Huckleberry Lady. My friends at Atheist Nomads do great podcasts from the middle of Idaho. Check it out. Hashtag secular, hashtag atheism. Hashtag Bremerton. Washington. <laughs> Rusty lives in, in the middle of Idaho. And uh, yeah, so <laughs> I, I, I know her. Uh, so cool. She doesn't know where you, you live, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Hence the hashtag Burnton, hashtag Washington. Yep, yep. 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 And from Heathen Mother, <laughs> that's at Heathen Mother, at Atheist mm -hmm. Nomads, who let the dogs out? Mm -hmm. I audibly laughed in the grocery store. <laughs> well, you're welcome. <laughs> I don't remember that being said. Yeah, I, I sneak that in every like 10, 12, 12 episodes. Okay. That, All right. No good reason to, but yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for catching it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> then uh, regarding episode 133, it's our mm. uh, last episode, the interview with Eli Bosnick. Um, we've got Tyler via Facebook. Hey, just subscribe to your podcast after hearing the Eli episode. Love the content and love having more like-minded voices out there. Sweet. Though, and please don't take this as a slight against your production efforts, just constructive criticism. Whoever's tasked with editing should be more mindful of the natural rhythm of speech while editing. There are quite a lot of rough cuts that were distracting. Not sure if it's just that episode. Haven't gone back through the back catalog yet. There's no real technical advice I can give. Unfortunately, cadence is just the more artistic part of editing speech. And from Thaddeus Lore, also on Facebook, what the hell happened with the editing? It sounds like Eli's ums and ahs were edited out, but the timestamp got moved forward, so the words before them got clipped, and the ums got left in. <laughs> uh, so what happened was a few, you know, probably about a month ago, I was doing some system updates. Audacity was updated. And it was crashing. I had to delete all of my settings. And I missed one. Uh -oh. That was the threshold on the silence trenication. Um. This isn't a problem when it's all stuff that 
Wesley, Lauren, and I record locally because we run compression during recording. So everything is up above that that threshold. Gotcha. And it's also not a problem when the guest is coming in on Skype because Skype runs compression. But we used Eli's local audio and he wasn't compressing it. And so when he got quieter, Audacity thought it was silence. Yeah, so we were trying to get three nice, beautiful, clean sources of audio and whoopsie. Yep. So So when I figured out what happened after getting Tyler's message on Friday, I ran some testing. I found that my hypothesis was was correct, and I quickly re-edited the episode. Oh, nice. I got it out within 30 minutes of redoing it. Uh, so it what went up. So if you downloaded it Thursday or Friday, you got the part where some of his words were missing. If you downloaded it Friday evening or later, you got basically an uncut episode. I knew a few cut points that I would have been doing, so I went ahead and did those. And I, yeah, I fixed things. Nice. It ended so, up being about five minutes longer. Oh, so if I can go out and. <laughs> Redownload download it. Uh, <laughs> so basically it was uh, the shitty version was out there for what? About 18 hours. Maybe a little uh, less. 20 hours, 22 okay. hours. Okay. That's yeah. You know, pretty fucking great. Cause you got a fucking job and shit. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. And I didn't know that happened until, until the Facebook. day after release. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, and what really sucks. See, I, we record the episode. I listen to it while editing and I usually don't listen to it again the next day. Uh, this one I was, I had thought about doing that because there'd been some changes in how we did it with, you know, using his audio and I ended up deciding not to. Yeah. So totally not Eli's fault and just a, a whoopsie. Sorry about that. And it'll be better next time. Yep. All right, and uh, also about the interview uh, from Chris Reed. Quite enjoyed the episode. This week's guys, great work. And from Justin Canning, holy shit, the roller coaster story. (laughs) And Travis McGee, I enjoyed that episode. Eli always cracks me up. Hell yeah. I I hope we get a picture from the roller coaster story. So right there with you. (laughs) (laughs) And we got two new iTunes reviews. One was about episode 133. Sweet. From Rebox. Love y'all's podcasts. And this one with Eli was hilarious. I look forward to hearing Atheist Nomads each week. Keep it up. Five stars. Fucking A. Rock that shit. All right. Uh, and then a, a general one from Travelin, Keeping My Sanity. Five stars. Mm. Love these guys. I devoured over 50 episodes in just two weeks. Amazing to hear the growth. Very candid interviews that are free form make for very unique interviews. I'm grateful for the E explicit rating, which generally allows for people to be themselves and not worry about guarding their language. Dustin and Wes are dudes. I can't wait to hang with drinks on me or in me, preferably bros. I stand by my above statement. I am still loving this podcast. Holy shit. You glutton for punishment, but thank you very (laughs) much. (laughs) Uh, Hey, should we make an announcement? Sure. Yes. Let's do it. Yeah. Uh, before we do anything else. So we're going to do a public episode here. Uh, don't know the where, but we definitely know the when. Mm -hmm. April nine, uh, Lauren and I will be heading up to Seattle. She'll be going to Emerald city comic-con, but I'll be hanging out with Wesley. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, so we'll do a live show. Uh, and uh, hang out with any listeners that want to come and, and buy us drinks so the, or just come and hang out. Yeah, totally. That will either be uh, somewhere between Seattle and Tacoma, Washington. So we'll have to figure that out. Uh, Tacoma is probably more likely. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. Uh, fucking A. Uh, I'm sure that uh, Sam, buddy of the show, will be will be in attendance too and quite a few of my friends from around here so come on down visit have a beer well i i know from the stats that the 
geographical area that we are the second most popular in is Washington. Mm -hmm. Sweet. Washington is only beat by California. Right. When you factor in the population difference between the two. Yeah. uh, We've got a lot of fans in Washington. So yeah, come, come hang out with us. It's always nice to to put faces. Hopefully you're not all over in Eastern Washington, but (laughs) it's always nice to put faces to the, the people on the, the other end of the earphones. Yeah. I will bring some beer. I'll bring some beer from one of my local places. Yeah. We'll, we might have to go outside and sneak a a couple of drinks, but you know, fuck it. We'll do this. (laughs) Yeah. So, Hey, we got a new supporter. Yeah. Fucking hey, Al wow. from South Carolina. So Al said, I uh, wanted to thank you and keep the quality content coming. Thanks, especially for the mental health episode. And yes, I thought of the kittens. Best wishes, Al. Al, those kittens really appreciate it. You have no idea. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's, you know, right now, as, as you all know, Lauren's not working and the podcast money is seriously making a difference yeah Uh, we would be without that we would be struggling to buy food with it we are doing okay uh six seven hundred dollars in student loan payments a month really eats into a salary quickly so yeah thank you thank you all And on that note, we'll be back next week with an interview. Yay. Thank you for listening to another episode of Atheist Nomads. You can find show notes and contact information at atheistnomads.com. Follow us on Twitter at Atheist Nomads. And like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash atheistnomads. Please subscribe to the show in iTunes, Stitcher, or your podcatcher of choice. And while you're there, feel free to leave us a review. The music is courtesy of Sturdy Fred. Until next time, this has been The Atheist Nomads.